Welcome everyone to a live taping of our Fikra Conversations with Daniel Reich, author of Qatar and the 2022 FIFA World Cup Politics, Controversy and Change. Daniel is a visiting research fellow at the Center for International and Regional Studies and an associate professor at Georgetown University Qatar, where he leads a research initiative on the FIFA World Cup 2022. Welcome, welcome Daniel to our Fikra Conversations. Thank you, Mickey, for the kind introduction. I guess the first question is, um, for those of you who don't know, um, where are you calling in from? <laughs> I'm from Germany, but yeah. I'm in the Middle East since a long time. I joined the American University of Beirut in 20, 2008. And uh, I've stayed in Lebanon 12 years until I joined Georgetown University in Qatar in summer 2020, which is the second time I'm joining Georgetown because I have my first faculty job was in 2006, 2007, a visiting assistant professor position at Georgetown's main campus in Washington, DC. Amazing. So the reason why I asked was because uh, 2020 was an interesting time to uh, join um, a university campus in Qatar. Um, but my question is for you, how long had you sort of been fixated on writing a book about the World Cup in Qatar in 2022? When did the project sort of start in your mind? Well, I wrote my first article on Qatar in 2014. Um, and my interest was to understand why does Qatar want to host the World Cup? Because um, the whole world uh, communicated what they think about Qatar being the World Cup host, and you know there was a lot of negative coverage. Um, but I was particularly interested in understanding the motives of Qatar to host the event, and that was um, the content of my first article, which was titled um, "Sport as a Foreign and Domestic Policy Tool: The Case of Qatar," published in the International Journal for Sport Policy and Politics. And uh, this book, of course, um, it's important to mention that it's written with uh, uh, Paul Brenning, a colleague from Manchester Metropolitan University in England. And uh, of course, we just saw it uh, since Paul wrote his dissertation on, on Qatar and uh, I, I, I'm based now here. So we thought we might be a good team uh, for uh, publishing a book that is published before the World Cup. Yeah. It's really nice. I mean, going back to um, growing up in Germany and um, I'm sure being obsessed with football and sports as as because sports is so important to culture in Germany. Um, had you always thought about sporting events and um, international competition as a tool for crafting national identity and as a tool and sort of a playground for for politics and economics? No, um, all my degrees were in, in, on environment, uh, environment and energy policy. Um, but um, uh, when I moved to Lebanon in 28, I noticed that all the professional Lebanese uh, uh, men's uh, football and basketball clubs were affiliated with certain religions and political parties. And uh, I published in 2011, of course, the research was in the year and two before, an article titled War Minus the Shooting the Politics of Sport in Lebanon, which was my first scholarly contribution on, on sport. And then, you know, I published on a plethora of, 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 of different issues and um, also kept teaching a class on the politics of sport. And uh, so over time, it became my main research interest, although I think the majority of my citations comes from my energy work. Yeah, amazing. So let's talk a little bit about um, when, how you approach the research for 2022. Um, and up on the screen, I have um, the history of where the World Cup has been hosted since 1930. Um, yeah. Do you think there's something special about this year's um, this year's games that may be different and maybe worthwhile for a student of the history to to keep in mind when they are studying the effect 
that the World Cup may have on on Qatar and the region for the next you know 20 years? Yeah, first of all, it's special that it's happening in the Middle East and in the Arab world and in a Muslim majority country. Uh, all of them never happened before. Then it's also the first World Cup in 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 the European winter. Um, I'm just saying this because when uh, people in my home country complain about the Winter World Cup, of course, it's not winter everywhere in the world. Uh, we <laughs> used to have the privilege in Germany to to watch a World Cup and you know have a barbecue in the garden and put the TV out. Um, but this time, this privilege goes to people in Argentina, New Zealand, and uh, South Africa. I, I think that's important to mention. Yeah, and apart from the geographic uh, um, and 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 uh, time of the year, um, uh, of course, what is special is that um, uh, we have a new technological feature at the World Cup with the cooling technology, um, which we did not have at any other. A sporting event before. Plus, also what is interesting is the short distances between the stadiums, so there won't be any domestic air travel necessary different to Russia, Brazil, South Africa, and others. Yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit about that um, the sustainability, since that's really um, some a key part of your your academic training. And you had just mentioned this this new technology. Um, you know, part of the criticism in 2014, originally when the first came out, was how are how are the how are the athletes going to run? How are we going to keep the stadiums cool? How is that possible? Um, talk to me about this technology. What does that actually look like? Um, and how yeah, is mean, it not um, just you know? Qatar was awarded awarded the uh, FIFA World Cup 2022 in December 2010. Mm. And it was at that time awarded uh, a World Cup uh, to be staged in July, August of 2022. In 2015, FIFA decided to move the World Cup to November and December. I attended this June a World Cup qualifier uh, match in Doha between the UAE and uh, Australia. And I have to say, there were perfect conditions in the stadium. The match was very fast. You forgot about the uh, extreme outside temperature. So they are really able to cool down the tournament. But I think, of course, when we talk about an event like the World Cup, it's not just about the players. It's also about all the fans who come to the country. And I would assume that in July, August, they would not have enjoyed Qatar as much as they hopefully will do now in November and December. Uh, you know, this country has rapidly developed there yeah, for many parks, for example, uh, you can you can walk on the Pearl, this artificial island, uh, in Lucerne, a new city is being built with a nice corniche. So there, there, there's lots to do. And, and I think in summer, uh, uh, visitors would have been limited to, to, to shopping malls, and there's a plethora of shopping malls in the country. So this is a decision that makes sense. When it comes to sustainability, uh, so um, the cooling technologies, so Qatar says that um, all the electricity in the stadiums come from solar uh, electricity. I mean, this is a mathematical issue, of course, bec uh, because Qatar has built a huge uh, solar plant in the desert, which is producing 800 megawatts, so it's around 10% of Qatar's solar electricity, and it's sad that the uh, electricity for the stadiums. Uh, but there also, uh, you know, there is sustainable transportation. So a metro has been built, for example. So um, when it comes to the supply side, a lot has changed in the country. I think the challenge for the next years is to tackle the demand side. Because the Emir was traveling to the 2021 climate conference and he promised that Qatar would reduce 25% of its greenhouse gases until 2030. And I think that's a very ambitious goal, and it might be difficult to achieve it if not also the demand side is tackled. So I think we will get a conversation in the next uh, years or right after the World Cup. How can we motivate people to re to use less water, electricity, and 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 uh, fuels for cars? 
and there might be a mix of measures necessary to uh, to, to to modulate people to uh, to to use less. Uh, so of course, uh, one way would be to to increase prices, um, but raise awareness. Uh, so there is uh, stricter standards for technology. So there is a mix of measures uh, are possible to achieve the goals. And um, I mean. Um, uh, it's an ambitious goal, and uh, it will require a lot of effort to achieve it. But Qatar usually takes uh, um, international treaties quite serious, so I'm positive that we will see serious policies to accomplish this. What is it if uh, somebody who hasn't gotten their hands on um, the the latest book that you uh, published along with? Paul uh, Brannigan. Um, I want to talk about the sort of the last word in the title. Uh, so the title is Qatar and the 2022 FIFA World Cup Politics, Controversy and Change. Um, how do you spell out that change um, in the book? And what do you expect the sort of the next 12 years to look like um, in Qatar and in the region because of the the ambition of hosting the cup the games as well as the process of hosting the games yeah look i mean first of all titles of publications are a very important <laughs> matter and at the beginning of my career i didn't pay much attention to this but today always when i publish something i really carefully think about titles and paul and i had uh, lots of discussions about this uh, and um and we included the word change uh, uh, on purpose. Of course, um, you know, you in the title, you can just have a number of words. And and um, and when you read the last chapter of the book, uh, of course, when it comes to change, uh, we have a nuanced discussion and we don't say like that everything changed. Um, but, um, but, but there are areas where we can see a lot of change, particularly when it comes to migrant worker rights. Uh, so the last two years, uh, Qatar has seen a firework of reforms uh, from the introduction of a minimum wage. The kafala system has been dismantled, so one can switch jobs now without approval from the employer. One can leave the country without approval from the uh, employer. This year, the uh, uh, summer hours have been extended where outside work is not permitted. So this, you know, Qatar has become a pioneer in the Gulf. In the Gulf. Um, and um, in other areas, change might happen more incremental because on migrant worker rights, there is really radical change. I don't know any other country that has changed so much in such a short period of time. So in other areas, change might be more incremental. But the country is changing. Of course, also infrastructure can always be changed faster than a culture. And this is more generational thing. And I think many of my students here at uh, Georgetown and students in Education City might uh, have different values when they raise their children one day compared with their parents or grandparents. I think this is normal. It's happening all over the world. Um, but the change is happening. and. Um, and um, but most change certainly has happened on on migrant worker rights. Yeah, super interesting. Um, I want to zoom out and think about the history of sport more broadly because one of the other books that you have been involved with is a book um, entitled "The Root: The Rutledge uh, Handbook of Sport in the Middle East" um, that you edited along with um, the same the same person, Paul Michael Brannigan. Um, and what's interesting about this book is that it looks at the history across the entire region. So the influence of sport in Oman and Bahrain and all these different places. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the intent of this project and some of this, what you understood, what, the new things that you learned in the course of editing? Yeah, I mean, um, there are lots of differences in, in the region when we look at the region. And um, so, um, um, I mean, we will be witness the first uh, uh, Middle Eastern World Cup at the end of this year, but of course, for many other countries in the regions, it's a distant dream to host a mega sporting event. Um, uh, when we look at Yemen or, or, or Syria, 
Um, um, so um, they they have other issues than um, than discussing which which mega sporting event they might host next. I mean, uh, so um, so of course there there this is this is not a homogeneous uh, a region and and uh, um, all these differences is something uh, that is I think a main feature um, of the book. Uh, but but certainly, uh, what can be said is that um, there is a new conversation in sports about like centers and peripheries of sport. So usually, sport was mainly associated with North America and uh, Japan, and later on China and Europe. And and now uh, we have uh, uh, some countries here in the region, uh, uh, the Gulf states. Uh, but also Turkey, um, uh, uh, Israel, they are becoming like uh, more important uh, in global sports. We even have seen that uh, uh, an international federation, the International Cricket Federation, moved from England to the UAE, the headquarter. So, so this region is becoming more important. And now with the increasing oil and gas prices uh, in times of the Russian-Ukraine war, um, uh, uh, and 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 the, 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 on the other hand, the, the economic decline in many other countries. Uh, this region will not host less; it will host even more events, I believe, in the future. So uh, this region will move to the center of uh, uh, global sports. Uh, but of course, it doesn't apply to all the countries in the region because some some of the countries have like uh, a serious uh, domestic uh, uh, problems. Um, you know, in the, in the US and in Europe, um, there's a sort of the club system, right? Where student uh, folks, uh, little kids get involved in sports and they go from, you know, little league or, you know, juniors and they move up and they, and that's how they're, they're really is built a culture of sports throughout society. Um, I wonder what that looks like in places like um, like Qatar, where there are so many folks who are uh, expatriates. Yeah. So, Qatar, you know, what have you found in your studies? Yeah, I think I think you know um, uh, Qatar um, has established in two thousand four uh, the Aspire Academy, which is like a big complex for uh, the development of sporting talents. And um, most of the team that will represent Qatar at the FIFA World Cup 2022 are graduates from the Aspire Academy. Also, Mutas Bashim, the high jumper, who won the gold medal at the last Olympics, is a graduate of this academy. In the academy, the Qatari citizens and long-term residents are treated equally. And um, so they both enjoy um, the support from this Academy, and then if athletes are promising, they are often nationalized and, and represent uh, Qatar. And I honestly think it's a better approach to, to support people who live here, who mm. identify with the country rather than importing athletes from wherever in the world who don't have much connection with the country. Yeah. Just on a personal note, um, how does it feel to be in Doha? These days, I mean, is it World Cup twenty four seven? You when you get a coffee, it says World Cup. When you <laughs> get on, take a taxi, it says World Cup. Is that is that everything? Uh, all that anyone can think about these days. Um, yeah, we just had like a fifty days um, event uh, yesterday here at Georgetown, and uh, we celebrate the entire week the World Cup here in our atrium. Um, and um, yes, also in my classes, we discuss a lot about the World Cups, you know, and also domestically, there are different conversations than those in the global media. The global media is on issues like migrant worker rights, uh, LGBTQ, but domestically here, we have, we are more like discussing where the logistics work um, and um, is there sufficient accommodation for all the visitors? 
Um, so more issues like the functionality of the event is more, I think, in the focus of those who who live here because it's a huge challenge for such a tiny country with less than three million inhabitants that expects 1.5 million visitors. And um, so, of course, we all hope everything is going well, but it's a huge challenge for for the country. Do you feel like there's um, a greater? It's funny when I, if I look at this history, um, it's almost like I mean, visitors per capita obviously is through the roof compared to uh, uh, the rest of the the rest of uh, the fo the countries on this um, on this screen. You know, Russia, Brazil. These are massive countries: Germany, um, France. I wonder, would you say that impact per capita also will be sort of higher than ever? Like yeah, legacy per all, capita? Thanks. I haven't thought about this measure uh, of visitors per capita. Of course, <laughs> the yeah. capita is. Uh, I mean, there was one other small country hosting the World Cup in 1930, Uruguay, but at that time it was a small event. Uh, today yeah. we have 32 teams, 64 matches. Uh, it's broadcasted uh, 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 on the whole planet. Um, but yeah, I honestly don't know any other World Cup that had so much impact on um, the host community um, as the World Cup had. But but you know, to be fair, um, Qatar. Qatar's, you know, changes um, did not start with being awarded the World Cup in 2010. I think when it comes to migrant worker rights, we can clearly relate this to the discussion that started after being awarded the World Cup and human rights organizations taking Qatar, etc. But, but for example, we just discussed Aspire Academy it was established in 2004. Um, uh, uh, Georgetown here opened in 2005, and it was not the first university in Education City. Education City started some years earlier. Uh, Al Jazeera, Qatar Airways, they both had their 25th anniversary recently. So with, with um, the Qatar's game changer was the liquid natural uh, uh, LNG gas that it could start exporting in the late 1990s, which led to tremendous wealth. And this tremendous wealth, I believe, was in a smart way um, invested. And yeah. um, of course, the World Cup serves so many, so many different purposes. That's why we could write a book about it, because it's not just a World Cup like in Germany or so, where you know there was already the sporting infrastructure and there were experience in organizing a big events and and um but but um but of course there are also issues uh, one can analyze around the german world cup but but here is like uh, 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 it's to be on the map to 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 gain influence in international affairs uh, to punch above its weight um and as we wrote uh, to, to contribute to economic diversification but also to national security so it serves so many purposes you know and it's also quite unique that a country is How using it? sport as a as a as a as a is it's, it's quite unique that I'm sorry to finish the sentence. Uh, it's yeah. quite unique that a country is integrating a World Cup into its domestic development, but also putting it at the forefront of its foreign policy. So that's that's what I wanted to ask you. Um, how does it actually integrate? Like, if you were to explain it to a 15 year old. Right. A 15 year old who, who hears you say that sentence, you know, they're using World Cup to integrate into their foreign policy and not just their economic policy. I could imagine a 15 year old would understand that economic. Yeah. You know, there's 1.5 million people coming. There's billions of people watching. All of that has uh, an economic uh, component to it. But the history of the political component, I. I, I would love to hear you explain that to a 15-year-old. Well, uh, I'm experienced in explaining things to a 12-year-old at home. <laughs> Perfect, so, but, even better. <laughs> but, uh, and 12-year-olds are very smart today. Um, so, yeah, of course, uh, when we talk about soft power, which, uh, uh, you know, means uh, reputation, um, uh, um, uh, but also public diplomacy, branding, um, it's difficult to measure. 
um, because it, it depends on not the sender, it depends on the recipient. So, of course, soft power is not a mathematical tool that we can say, oh, we host the World Cup and we build a national museum and we um, we invest into a TV channel and then we are like an influential in global affairs. It's not that simple. Um, but um, the uh, uh, Qatar standing in the world is at the moment pretty good. And uh, this is, of course, related to different developments. Uh, last year, when we had the Afghanistan crisis, uh, Qatar played a great role in helping to evacuate uh, 10,000s of people from Afghanistan. Many Western embassies were re relocated from uh, Kabul to Doha. Uh, Qatar is helping many countries uh, 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 in its uh, energy security, so it's a supplier to an increasing number of countries. Also, the gas field in Qatar is expanding, so Qatar will be able to export gas to even more countries in the future. So um, I would say to the 12-year-olds that Qatar is using uh, uh, the gas. It has uh, in a smart way, because it's not just setting it to like one or two countries, it's setting it to a number of countries to build relations with that countries. And it's also using the revenue it gets from the selling of the gas smart, uh, because it invests in its future, for example, with Education City, with Qatar Airways, um, uh, in, 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 in culture, um, in a national airline, and uh, to, to be ready for the time when no oil and gas is left anymore. Okay, interesting. Um, I want to uh, switch to uh, the history of sports across the region and go back to that the the book that you uh, you published. Um, are there any fun stories that surprised you in the process of editing it, from you know handball in Egypt to <laughs> you know? Uh, um, long distance runners. Are there anything that sort of come to mind? Honestly, um, I what I found interesting was, for example, is a contribution from Mohammed El Sharma, uh, titled um, "A Former Student of Mine at the American University of Beirut, who works it's now the, for um, uh, a newspaper." The Jewish Olympian. Yes, um, so he told the story of David Saad, Lebanon's last Jewish Olympian. So there is a small Jewish community in Lebanon, and uh, uh, David uh, 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 Mohammed had a number of conversations with him. He he lives now in uh, Canada or the U.S. I'm not sure, um, and um, uh, he, uh, he represented uh, uh, Lebanon uh, in uh, the. Uh, Montreal Olympics in, in 1968. And um, I found this work quite uh, original because that's something I had not read anywhere before. Yeah. Um, and, 1976. Uh, 1976, I'm sorry, I said 1968. Yeah, yeah 1976 with the Montreal Olympics. Also then Matthias Krug, um, uh, uh, he wrote um, a contribution on... Um, uh, Qatar becoming uh, the runner-up at the 1981 uh, under-20 youth football championship in Australia. I think that's also a story that many people don't know. They think there was no cut, uh, football in Qatar before, but um, so Qatar was... How is that possible? With, I mean... With like 100,000 people living here, you know, it was a small country. <laughs> but it's, it's crazy. I mean, I, I saw that in the book. That shocked me. I mean... Um... Yeah, that's that's shocking to me. Yeah, and um, but uh, I mean, um, uh, then of course, what I also found interesting uh, was um, by uh, Ladan Rabari, um, uh, 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 a chapter on uh, uh, Iranian uh, um, female athletes who would defect from from Iran because of the. Um, a body politics uh, in the country. Um, so, um, but we also have uh, on disabled sport, for example, in the UAE, um, we have on, on heritage sports like falconry, uh, we have on ultra fan groups in Egypt. 
So on the on the on the heated derby in Israeli football between Harpoe Tel Aviv and Maccabi Kabi Tel Aviv. So <laughs> there are 33 chapters, and I think there's lots to discover. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting because you know, through our fikra, um, we talk about history a lot, we talk about culture, we talk about art, music, film. Um, and in the 500 presentations people have given throughout the community, I think maybe one or two of them have been on sport. Mm. Um, maybe. And it's heartbreaking because it's such a big part of life in the in the region. I mean, sport is such a big part, uh, both for athletes who play as well as spectators. It is stitched through our daily life. Um, yeah. And it's not really taken that seriously from a cultural standpoint. People don't think of it as something worth thinking about and having cultural value. Um, no, I, I guess with you, I mean, because when we look at people's everyday life, uh, you know, most of us practice sports, most of, most of us follow sports. Of course, it's always not the same. For example, I spend so many hours watching football on TV, but I'm not playing football. I do many other things uh, on sport. So <laughs> yeah, practicing sport, following sport, uh, but you know, sport is a business. Uh, so there are many uh, interesting uh, categories. And I mean, yeah. it's a, uh, it's still an academic niche, but it's growing. You know, it's funny. I remember like maybe about 15 years ago or 10 years ago, maybe 15, there was a, a growing concern, uh, medical concern in the, in the GCC uh, around obesity and there being a serious risk, health risk associated with obesity and also a huge economic risk associated with it because of the healthcare costs. Um, because of all the ailments that come from that are linked to obesity. Um, so it's funny when I when I saw a very strategic emphasis placed on sport um, in Qatar, but also across across the GCC that increasingly, I figured maybe this is a strategic choice to say, no, we as a nation are athletic. This is part of our our um, our vision. Uh, you know, are these are part of our values? We are an athletic society. Have you have you heard people talk about that, or am I way off the mark? Yeah, I mean, um, it's a, I mean that's a good idea, of course, to to frame uh, the promotion of sport uh, as a public health issue, uh, since uh, obesity is is, is uh, much spread in in the entire Gulf. Um, but you know. Um, what is interesting about Qatar is that um, it's not just um, the World Cup. So uh, it's uh, Qatar has, for example, a national sports day. It's a public holiday dedicated to the promotion of sport. Yeah. Um, since I don't want to say a wrong number, I think 2014, 2015, but it was introduced after the World Cup. And uh, I remember it's always in February of each year. So it's also time of the year, which is uh, very pleasant outside. And yeah. I remember where I live, uh, my son and I, we walked around and it was crazy. So, so all the people were out and one could play table tennis. Um, uh, and there were so many uh, activities. Um, uh, there yeah. were outside sports classes. Uh, I think I did a cycling, also, uh, a spinning class outside somewhere. And um, so I think this is the right approach. And also Qatar has built so many public parks uh, where one can nicely walk. And um, so it's not just the, the investments on the elite level. There's also um, a lot yeah. of encouragement for every one of us who lives here to, uh, to practice sport. And um, so, of course, for me, as somebody who academically works on sport, it's a perfect environment because I really have every single day the impression that sport is so much valued in this country. Yeah, it's like, and there's the 321 um, Olympic and Sport Museum. Um, for those, are you familiar? Are you very familiar with what they do? Oh yeah, uh, I've been there. Yeah, if you could talk a little bit about um, what that museum is, it might, for those so, people who are listening. Let me know. let me 
take this question as an opportunity because you had some you shared some slides so we have here at, research, uh, at georgetown a research initiative building a legacy qatar fifa world cup 2022 since fall 2020 where we look at the impact of the world cup on qatar and we have different pillars we have a lecture series all the lectures are online available we have a blog and we have this podcast and we just had an episode with um, the director of the museums and one of the curators uh, because they just opened a new exhibition on uh, global football um, uh, but the museum it's it's really terrific i mean it's about the history of sport in general across countries and also specifically in qatar and now there is this uh, exhibition dedicated to world football history which will run throughout the world cup and uh, so the museum is impressive and it's facing one of the World Cup stadiums, the Kaf Kaf Kafila International Stadium, which was for the first stadium in Qatar and for a long time the only stadium before now for the purpose of the World Cup, seven other stadiums uh, have been built. And I think this is also a great example about how much sport is valued here in the country that Satran uh, Olympic Museum is, is, is built in the country. I don't know official numbers, but I think the state of Qatar really put a lot of resources into making this uh, an impressive experience to, to visit that museum. And they also have like a lecture hall. We, we recently ha had an event there from Georgetown University, for example. There is also now a lecture series where I give myself talks. So I think they it's impressive what they are doing. And this will uh, be also interesting for tourists in the future who come to Qatar to visit it and one can spend there at least half a day. Amazing. So what do you think is coming up um, over the next, you know, next decade uh, from a sports perspective, international sports perspective across the region? Are there other ambitions uh, throughout yeah. the region, throughout the Arab world that you you know more than me about the next sort of 10, 20 years? Yeah, what the I would are? say two to uh, Two answers. One is when it comes to Qatar, I don't think much is changing. Qatar signed a 10 year contract with Formula One. Uh, the first race will be next year. There was already one last year, but this was replacing Australia because of COVID. So there will be at least 10 races in Qatar. Uh, there will be the Asian Games 2013 in Qatar. On October 17, the Asian Football Confederation will announce who will replace China as 2023 Asian Cup host. Maybe it might be Qatar. So we have here so many tennis, golf, whatever tournaments. So, so sport will remain the main feature uh, of this country. Uh, but of course, I think what is most interesting at the moment in the region, how Saudi Arabia is copying a Qatar's approach with a 25 year delay. So Qatar was hosting a 1993 and ATP tennis tournament, which I want to mention as a German was won by Boris Becker. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but then 25 years later, Saudi started to host like Italian, Spanish, Football Super Cup, etc. Now they have this own series in golf. They yeah. so happy to invest into sports. So I think we will see... Uh, and they bought Newcastle United, uh, a Premier League club. So I think we will see Saudi as a major player in international sports. What I personally wish is that sport is not only as in the past a competition and distinction tool in the golf, but might also become something for cooperation and to um, I mean why can Qatar and Saudi not host sporting events together I mean they they share a land border and many uh, we shouldn't also forget when we talk about countries that many families are transnational many families here have parts of their family in Saudi so why should these countries not be able to cooperate more and what else would be better to do so than sports yeah absolutely okay i want to go to the quick q a and then i know we have to we're going to end a little early to because you have another engagement right afterwards so let's do the quick q a and then we will wrap up um what are you reading or watching right now 
<laughs> so um, I just read this book from my friend John McManus inside Qatar. It's like an anthropological story. He lived here one year and shares his experiences. And uh, I'm a TV series guy, so I just watched um, Trying on Apple TV. It's okay. about a couple that wants to get a child and it doesn't work, and then they adopt a child. It's super funny, but also emotional, so can recommend it. Okay. Who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Wow. <laughs> I would love to shadow the Emir of Qatar because uh, I think that um, um, he has made many uh, many smart decisions in the past, and um, maybe I could also share some opinions like the one I just did now on sport as a tool for cooperation with neighboring countries. Okay, cool. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work? Um, that this is not really a sports book. It's just using sport to, ex uh, to it's explaining through the lens of sports, politics, and society. Yeah. Do you think, okay, so let me ask another question to this. Do you think you, as Daniel, need to love sports in order to do your job well? Or is it really not about sports at all? Well, I'm I'm a sports fanatic, um, and I'm a diehard uh, fan of my local football clubs, and um, uh, look forward to watch matches at the World Cup. But no, I don't think uh, I I know sports scholars who don't spend much time um, watching sports. I don't think it's necessary. Plus, you know, to be honest, I also wrote. I also wrote articles on sports that I don't understand well. Uh, because um, as uh, uh, Markowitz and Rinsmann are writing in their great book on global sports, it's here somewhere in the shelves, learning a sport is a bit like learning a language. And if you haven't learned it as a child, then you struggle with properly understanding it. Yeah, so, so I wrote a couple of articles on rugby. Um, because rugby has some interesting features, like with the residence rule that you don't need a passport of a country to represent it, which attracted me as a scholar to, to, to research it. But when I watch a rugby match, there are always situations where I'm just thinking, oh my God, who can explain me this? Um, and I don't have this in football because I grew up in a football household. We were always watching football and in football, I could explain every minor issue. So yeah, uh, that's happening. So um, yeah, so no, I don't think one needs to be sports fanatic or fanatic of the respective sport to research it. Okay, I'm going to change this last question. The last question was, who do you admire or are inspired by? I'm going to change that. Who are you rooting for? My favorite football team is Hanover 96. They're playing in the second German league. I'm also following another team from my home city, which is uh, Arminia Hannover. They are just in the 50. You can see they are both represented on my wall. Um, and the German national team, of course. What I found shocking, how much my um, my sporting interest is driven by my local origin and by my nationality. Because to be honest, when I watch a national team playing, it's in 95% of the cases, Germany. Um, so I found it interesting how much nationality and ethnicity drives our sporting interest, including mine. Yeah, of course. Um, my last question before we before we go is is actually a historical one. I'm curious about if we just look at the screen for a second about you know the the I guess thirty of them or close to thirty uh, World Cups that have uh, taken place. Um, have there been uh, lessons that need to be learned um, over the course of the last you know, 20 years or 30 years or 40 years? Possible negative uh, repercussions from hosting events like this, these mega sporting events that 
we need to sort of learn from or that we have learned from? <laughs> well, one lesson is every time the, uh, the World Cup became bigger and the number of teams was increased from 12 to 16 to 24 to 32 now, then next World Cup 48, every time there's an argument, oh, there might be not enough appetite for it and this might kill the sport, but the opposite is happening. I mean, this is uh, the event is just becoming bigger and bigger. This is a truly global sport. And uh, it's no problem to have more countries included in it. And um, uh, having lived 12 years in Lebanon, uh, I, I hope that Lebanon might qualify maybe next time. So yeah, I think that's one lesson. It's becoming bigger and bigger. And there, there seem to be no limits to the growth of, of the game. Okay, cool. My last question to you before I let you go is, what are you working on now? What's what's coming up next? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, I'm i just happy that I got this two, two books out this year. And, um, and um, at the moment, I'm really much occupied with the World Cup because uh, of the research initiative we have here. I'm uh, organizing... Uh, uh, um, events and uh, uh, I'm responsible for this podcast and the blog and um, and we have uh, um, launched a working group at Georgetown with scholars from both Qatar and abroad, uh, which is working on a book um, titled Moving from the Periphery to the Center, Qatar's World Cup Goals, where we discuss to what extent the World Cup is enabling Qatar to move from the periphery to the center of global sports and politics. And we had a workshop in March uh, where we discussed research gaps. And we had a workshop right now, a couple of weeks ago, where we discussed uh, manuscripts that were submitted by the participants. So uh, in, after the World Cup in spring, I will work with my colleagues in the Center for International and Regional Studies at Dr. Van Qatar on um, a book publication. Uh, with uh, uh, the contributions, um, and um, and then uh, this will keep me busy until next summer at least. And I have not yet. I'm I'm working with colleagues on on like uh, uh, different articles. Um, uh, I just worked with a colleague on on the role of long term residents in Qatari sports, an article, and with another colleague on. How Qatar's culture is changing, but like I, I, I assume your question is like, what's the next big, big, big project? Something like this or that? Um, yeah. And I think I first need to watch all the certain sixty-four World Cup matches <laughs> before I make a decision on that. Yeah, I feel like uh, Daniel, you have to you have to uh, update that title that you're sort of about the center from the center to the periphery. I think it should be something like taking center field or something like that or. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure we have lots of discussions on the title, but the have... Center for International Regional Studies, they have published 50 books since, since they exist. And I think they, my we'll colleagues, they are quite experienced in coming up with a good title. Yeah. Um, before, actually, I do have one last question. If you could have attended any games in the history of, uh, you know, the last hundred years, Olympics, uh, tennis, fo uh, football, basketball, if you could have been at any single sporting event, which one would you have wanted to go to? Well, to be honest, Mickey, I attended uh, the uh, 1992 Germany a German Cup final between my team Hanover 96 and Borussia Mönchengladbach, which Hanover 96 uh, won as the only second league team ever in the German football history. So I'm just glad that I was able to attend this historic match um, Amazing. And uh, there's no other match that I regret that uh, I did not see it. Um, and um, um, but uh, of course, I <laughs> I hope now uh, since I live and work in Qatar that I will also watch matches at the World Cup that I will remember all my life. Amazing. 
Well, Daniel, thanks so much. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know it's a very, very busy for you these days in the last couple of days before, in the last weeks before the World Cup. So thanks for taking the time and I look forward to uh, seeing you soon, hopefully. Thank you for having me, Mickey. Okay, everybody. Um, this will go up on the podcast tomorrow and it's going to go up on YouTube uh, as well. And uh, we'll see you on Wednesday. All right, Daniel, thanks so much.